Hey friends, Brian Burns here with the Master Key Group at Remax Downtown and we're talking about the fundamentals of real estate investing. Now in particular, over the past few weeks, we've been talking about the real estate investor and really any investor's arch nemesis and that is capital gains tax. Now we've also introduced the heroes to the story and that is 1031 exchange and his trusty sidekick section 121. And we'll talk today about how these two heroes will vanquish our foe, okay? So we're gonna give an example here, and this is more of a, the, a pathway to retirement, if you will. All right, so we're gonna say it's 2020, and we'll just say you're 30 years old, you've decided you wanted to buy your first investment property. What we're gonna do is we're gonna to continue to buy an investment property every five years. Then, by the time we're 60, we're gonna start planning for our retirement. And so we're gonna start selling off these properties. Then what we're going to do is we talked about it last week is that you can combine investment properties. Okay. So we have now five properties. We're going to sell these properties and then we're going to combine them into one real estate investment because you have to make it an investment of like kind. So then what you'll do is at 60, you will buy your retirement home. And then you're thinking, well, you're not 65 yet or 67 and a half. Well, then what we do is because it's an investment, we have to rent it out for a minimum of two years. After that, all we have to do is own it for five and live in it for two for it to become then your primary residence. That's where section 121 kicks in. A lot of people don't realize that if you make, if you're a single person and your net proceeds from the sale of your primary residence are over $250,000, or if you're married and it's over $500,000, you actually still have to pay capital gains tax on it. But most people, when they sell a primary residence, they usually roll that money over into their new primary residence. So a lot of people don't know that. So what we do now is we take our five properties, roll them over into an investment, rent it for two years, and then as soon as you live in it for two years, it becomes your primary residence and then excludes you from $250,000 as a single person or $500,000 as a married couple uh, worth of capital gains tax. So you'll basically wipe the slate clean. And uh, let me show you how, all right? So it's 2020, we buy our first property. Now this costs you $45,000. We're gonna put 20% down and we're gonna say there's about $5,000 in closing costs. Now, once you have this property, your life gets a little bit easier because if you do the math, and this doesn't have to be, you know, like a set clockwork schedule. You might buy one in 2020, maybe one in 2022, and then maybe you don't buy another one until 2032. You know, it, it really depends on the market. This is just an example. So once you have this property, you also have income, remember. So what we're gonna do is say that you're getting a net income of $400 per month. And if you can't get a net income of $400 per month, it's probably not the greatest investment. So we're making an extra $4,800 a year. Now, if you do the math, every five years, we need to come up with $45,000. That's $9,000 a year. Well, look, as, as long as we use, we can use this money to come up with it. So now, rather than $9,000 a year, which was the first one, this will be the hardest one to get, actually. And then once we make that, once we make that leap, now we only need to come up with $4,200 a year to hit our 2025 goal. Now, 2025 goal comes in, we're buying another $200,000 house. Now, will all of them be the same price? Obviously not. This is just an example, okay? So 2025 comes along and we buy another one. Now, we're making $9,600 a year. We're already at the goal. All we have to do is just put this, put this uh, rental income aside. And then we're on our way to 2030 buying our third one. 2030 comes around and our annual income, $14,000. Now this is great because now we're almost at $15,000. That means you could pur potentially purchase one in three years or life happens, you know? So maybe you have a kid, maybe you're going back to school, something like that. So now you just have additional income that's coming in and all you have to do is tuck that $9,000 away. And then these basically should be fairly easy after that. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna sell the properties, right? In order to use the money and to do a 1031 exchange, you have to sell them. We're gonna say that these properties appreciated in value at a very, very, very modest 3.5% a year. Now that is the national average uh, since they started recording it, but uh, you know, this involves selling the lowest of the lows and, you know, the, and the highest of the highs. So generally speaking, you should be able to get better than that, but I wanna show you just basically uh, you know, this example and make it easy. So 
This home, after 30 years, will be worth $600,000. And everyone thinks, well, how, you know, I don't think that it would really be worth that. Just look at somebody who's owned a home for 30 years. Go back in the tax records and see what they're selling them for now, okay? Now, we obviously have to pay our mortgage off. Usually, people use a standard 30-year mortgage. Well, after 30 years, we will owe nothing on the house, all right? So this is our totals down here at the bottom. Now, we have to sell the property, right? So selling a property usually has a cost to it. So between real estate fees and you know just general taxes, not, uh, not uh, capital gains taxes, but you know, and then who knows how you'll sell property, you know, 30, uh, 30 years from now. But this would be the cost, just under $150,000. You have to spend money to make money, right? Now, uh, this will be the net proceeds from the sale. After it all is said and done, you'll be walking away, or well, you would hopefully like to walk away with $1.6 million, but the tax man cometh. All right, now this is our depreciation because this will come into play for our uh, figuring out our capital gains tax. So over the past 30 years, now remember, uh, depreciation, you're able to get a, a tax credit writing off depreciation of your home for 27 and a half years. So we take the value of the home, divide it by 27 and a half, and that's how much money that you, can, uh, that you would write off each year. Now obviously this one has already been fully depreciated for two and a half years, but we're still gonna use it as the example because usually you would sell that property and then buy a new one to start using that depreciation, um, to use that depreciation tax credit. Overall though, we've written off $704,000 in depreciation, okay? Now, rental income. Now every year, your rental income goes, out, goes up about $4,800. But the big thing here is a lot of people that are, you know, and I would never advocate one over the other. I think they both work amazing together. Real estate versus stock, okay? Now, if you were to, all right, put $40,000, $45,000 into the stock market in 2020, and then remember, we're saving up $9,000 a year. So if you were to put $9,000 each year all the way up to 2040, the stock market would definitely beat this because people tend to expect about eight to 10% return on investment with the stock market. So we're only getting a three and a half percent return. So the, the stock market would actually blow this out of the water. The thing is with the stock market is that it doesn't have this, okay? It's not as easily accessible and generally you're, we're talking about retirement here. So there's a lot of penalties that are incurred to take that money out. The nice thing about this is that you can sell these and create liquid cash, but also, you have a set income coming in on a monthly basis. Almost if you're into stocks, it's almost like a monthly dividend, all right? Now, by the time it's all said and done, after 30 years, you'll have made $480,000 just in, uh, in residual income. Now, this is not something that you, you know, obviously it'll, if you wanna manage it, it will take you know, some time and things like that, but this is passive income, $480,000, so altogether, You've made over two million, two point one million dollars off of these investments. Now, remember here, we have bought two, uh, over a million dollars in property, but we didn't use two million dollars. We borrowed eighty percent of it from the bank. The only thing the bank wants you to do is pay them back. Well, we're not actually even paying them back. Your renters are paying them back. So now, actually, to buy one million of property. We're only bringing $40,000 to the table. We're bringing the 5,000 for closing. So overall, we've only spent out of pocket $225,000, okay? Now, what we need to do is we need to figure out what our tax liability will look like so that you could truly appreciate the 1031 exchange coupled with a section 121. So we have to come up with our net adjusted, or uh, sorry, adjusted net basis. We've already done this, but you have the original price, plus improvements minus depreciation. That gives us 396. So we have the adjusted net basis, which brings us to the next part. All right, we have capital gain. We need to figure out what the gain is so that the government can come in and take all your money. <laughs> so the sale price, 2.13 million. All right, the adjusted net basis, we just figured it out right there. And then the cost of the sale, all right, just under 150. So total, they're gonna say 1.5, almost 1.6 million of taxable capital gains. Now, the tax man cometh, right? So we have our depreciation recapture, and I think I misspoke on one of the previous episodes when I said 20%, it's actually a flat 25%, all right? So you've been writing all this off, Uncle Sam came back and he goes, all right, I want mine now. 
So we take this number here, 704,000, and we take 25% of it. Your tax bill is already $176,000, okay? Now, we have the federal tax, which is 15 to 20%. We'll choose the lower option, okay? And that's $132,000. Now you have your state income tax, okay? In Florida, which is why everyone loves it, it's zero. So we're done here. We owe $308,000 in capital gains tax. Now imagine, remember I said California has a 13.3% capital gain, or sorry, uh, uh, state income tax. That's almost 15%. So let's just say that it would be an additional $120,000 on top of that. Okay, so that would be, this number of 308 turns into probably about $430,000. Now, if you were to ask me, would I rather give the government three to $400,000 for them to spend? Or would I rather buy three to $400,000 more of a retirement home? I'm probably gonna do the latter, right? Which is why this 1031 exchange coupled with the section 121 is so powerful, all right? So now, rather than taking this away from this and going in with 1.3 million, you can use the full 1.638 million and then you can buy your retirement home. You rent it out for two years, then once the tenants are done in there and you hit that two year mark, you fix it up to however you want. And then now you're, and then, and then as long as you live in it for two years, this goes away, which is why it's one of the most powerful tools. So now you've used real estate to find the ideal uh, you know, home for you. And then when you have all of your stocks and your 401ks and everything like that, cashing in to supplement you on a daily basis, which is why it's such a powerful uh, tool to couple those two together. So. Uh, this is a lot today, but 1031 exchange coupled with section 121, it's an amazing tool, especially for retirement uh, and help you live comfortably. So next week, what we're gonna talk about is everyone wants to know, should I refinance? Okay, and I'm gonna show you mathematically how to figure it out because just because you're getting a lower payment does not mean it's the best option. All right, I'll talk to you then, bye.